shortcomings. This whole I equals P times A times T. The idea of population goes up, I goes up. Affluence goes up, I goes up. I being human impact, uh, or our impact on the environment. Uh, and then technology goes up. So where are some shortcomings to this? And this would be another example of a possible written response question. What are some shortcomings to the I equals P times A times T formula? And I'm asking this as a question. If we, we can recall it at all, the whole I equals P times A times T. Or maybe some things you're kind of, as you're sitting there, like, well, wait a minute, though. Huh. Nothing. We all have this thing, it's rock solid. Yeah, it is kind of, a, it's a week ago, so it's deep in there. Exactly, and so the idea of we have the high levels of technology where we could come up with all these various giz gizmos and gadgets to actually lessen our human impact on the environment. And so we have, in the case of the United States, we've got you know, all these high-tech sensors all throughout our city. They can recognize CO2 levels. Are CO2 levels high? Are they low? And where are they? And we can do something about it if we know where they are. And so high, having high levels of technology actually provides us the ability to have a much better understanding of our human impact and understanding various point sources for pollution, for example. Where is the pollution coming from? Uh, and so another example is using GIS. Uh, and so finding out clusters, where certain areas are, where certain hazardous materials might be exposed to the local environment causing higher cancer rates. Uh, and so these are things in Nigeria they don't have. Uh, and so it's, a, it's a very much uh, you know, attributed to our levels of technology. And so our higher level of technology actually can kind of lessen our human impact on the environment. And that kind of relates to affluence as well. Good. Exactly what I wanted to hear. What else as far as some shortcomings of I equals P, P times A times T? With some areas that have like higher population, um, like developing countries, wouldn't they have pretty low affluence though? Because they don't live the way we do? Exactly. And so that's why, that's why this formula, why I like it, is we can say, you know, affluence isn't their problem. They're not going out and buying more stuff uh, and all of that. Their problem is the population. It's just, it's just you know, way too high for, the, for the, you know, the amount of area uh, that they have as far as where they can live. Uh, and so you're finding in Nigeria, that's where it's even, you know, it's throughout much of Africa. It's very much, uh, these guys right here would tell you, uh, the two guys that were here earlier. I mean, it's, it's dire straits. What else we got? Critical thinkers, let's do it. Anything? So we think about the United States. Uh, and so earlier, we, we, we think about the idea that, look all, well, we don't have any maps here. Look all that land we have here in the United States. Uh, compare that to Nigeria. Look how much Nigeria. Nigeria has hardly any land. Uh, we've got all this space, and so we could set aside parks. We could set aside large areas and conserve those areas, preserve. Uh, in, in Nigeria, uh, exotic animals or humans, who's going to win? Humans, big time. Uh, and so when we think about in, in, you know, in Nigeria, one of the key things is um, you know, they have nowhere to, to, to set aside parks to protect their endangered species. There's nothing like that there. Uh, further, Burma. Uh, Burma is one of the poorest places in the world. Uh, and one of the things that's happening there is in China, uh, people demand, or not, you know, not a lot of people, but there's enough demand for, for blood from tigers. So it's tiger's blood. Not like I know Charlie Sheen kind of took that and ran with it. Uh, but the whole tiger blood thing, there's actually demand for it. It's something that's seen as something that's desirable. So what's happening to the exotic animal population in Burma? Going down big time. And that makes sense. Uh, for them, you know, affluence, hardly any. And so for them, it's an opportunity to make some money, sell something. Uh, and it's also, it's also a good place for, for heroin. Uh, if you're interested in heroin, Burma is a good place for that as far as producing it. Uh, but we've got all kinds of examples here. We could come up with all these different devices, like you mentioned, uh, as far as these different things we, we have, as far as our, our you know, higher affluence affords us these counteractive measures to lessen our human impact on the environment. So that would be one shortcoming uh, of this. And of course, we've got other examples here uh, as well. 
Uh, and so here's one of my friends. Uh, and so here's one of my friends that teaches down at Bloomington. He's a uh, he's an accounting professor, uh, accounting professor. Uh, and so what you know, here we are in the United States. What he's done uh, is he set aside. He's got this this land down in Brown County, uh, and he set it aside. He's sold it actually. Uh, and so this he sold it, and essentially he's protecting the environment. Uh, but at the same time, he's making some cash. He's an accountant. Uh, he's all about making money. Uh, and so here we see, you know, this isn't something that can happen in those places that have the population problem uh, that we talked about before, in those places that we talked about in those developing countries. They can't have all of a sudden a guy, a private landowner, donate his land so they can protect uh, the local species of trees. Uh, he's a big tree hugger. I mean, literally, I, there's, there's one time I went out in the woods with him, he stopped and he hugged the tree and kind of patted it on the, on the, on the trunk like, like it was a human being because uh, it's his favorite tree in his little forest there. Uh, but anyway... Um, so here's an example of how in affluent areas we can set aside areas and protect them uh, because there's not those demands for resources like there is in those lower income countries. Further, one of the things I like about globalization, one of the things I like about this leveling of the playing field, they always use this term, the world is flat. We know the world is not flat at all. Uh, but still, the whole idea, everyone's becoming more competitive. So it's no longer us, U.S. of A., having to come up with all the ideas for, to solve the world's problems. And so in China, in China, they've got a lot of problems there that they have to figure out. So let's them, let them figure it out. Let them, you know, spend all the money to come up with a new idea and see if it works instead of us being the ones uh, that see if it works. Um, and so here's our good friend Beijing. Uh, Beijing. This is Beijing. Uh, how is this Beijing? Uh, Beijing, they are building their sixth I-465. It's getting so big, it's expanding so much, the po population of Beijing is growing so quickly, the amount of people driving cars is growing so quickly that they can't keep up. They keep on building more and more and more 465s. So trust me, they've got a problem here. They've got a major transportation problem. So here's what they're kind of, one of the ideas they're kicking around. We've got these highways, we've got these built up roads. Let's essentially maximize our space by having a double, or sorry, a, 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 essentially a train that rides just above the highway. That's a pretty far out idea. That's a level of affluence. Once again, I'm not going to pick, or let's pick on uh, Botswana uh, or, or, or Liberia. They're not going to be the ones coming up with these ideas. And so this is why I like globalization. I like the idea of other people coming up with solutions uh, and trying to, and then us, of course, copying it. The world's been doing that to us our whole, uh, our whole last 60, 70 years. Further, local solutions to local problems. Here, once again, affluence, solar panel technology. Um, so it's another thing that affluence provides is these levels of technologies to counteract, to lessen our human, human impact on the environment. So no longer using renewable, or sorry, non-renewable resources, coal, oil, uh, things that emit CO2, the cleanest as you can get. This is probably the most ideal. However, as we note, uh, local solutions to local problems. In Indiana, yeah, we got a nice sunny day out here, but it's nothing like you would find out in the Great Plains, nothing like you would find in those various climate regions I talked about that have uh, you know, higher days of sunlight. And so in Spain, southwest United States, Mediterranean climates, it makes a whole lot of sense for them to use solar technologies, where in the Great Plains, they use wind technology. Now, Indiana, one of the things is we're seeing if you go north on 65, what do you see north of Lafayette? Nothing but windmills. Uh, and that's kind of one of those deals where eh, it's not doing a whole lot. Uh, all that is is you've got a lot of farmers who are trying to maximize the, money, the amount of money they make from their land. Uh, and so they're just adding windmills to add another income source. Uh, Indiana, we don't produce that much wind. If we do, it's going to be in the northern part of the state for the various reasons we mentioned earlier in this class. Uh, probably the most ideal would be that prairie area, Benton County, uh, from the Geography of Soils lecture. Pretty much the only area where actually wind is you know, powerful enough. Actually, where wind's the strongest is Lake Michigan. Uh, but of course, putting windmills in Lake Michigan and birds and all of that. Uh, anyway, uh, birds don't like windmills because propellers kind of suck when you run into them. At least that's what I've heard. All right, uh, continue on. Higher levels of technology kind of relates to the one that we just talked about uh, can actually uh, waste fewer renewable resources. And so we can use this as an example here in the United States. And I got some statistics that kind of, you know, I hope showcase this whole idea of us over time 
wasting fewer resources. Uh, with the key idea, recycling. Recycling. And recycling 30 years ago, uh, it was you know, maybe a few people who did it. Uh, you know, it was hardly anyone. Now, about half of us recycle. Uh, you know, we look at these recycling bins on campus, they're all over the place. And for the most part, they're full. Uh, and so they're pretty full. And so these are things, 20 years ago, if we were on this campus, you would have seen none of this. Uh, and so there, right there, could be an you know, example of us, over time, coming up with solutions to our problems. Uh, and so uh, creating less waste. Uh, and so some evidence I'll show of this is uh, as far as our, uh, our number of landfills are actually getting smaller. Um, well, uh, there's less of them, I should say. There's less landfills, and so we're getting better as far as using our, our, our resources, using our, you know, the products. We're not essentially just dumping them back uh, into um, a landfill. We're reusing a whole lot more. And a lot of companies, once again, making money. That's when these things become, uh, you know, actually, you know, when things actually happen, we can make some money. Uh, and so a lot of companies are buying scrap, me scrap metals, for example, and then taking those scrap metals, turning them into something new. Uh, so once again, you know, level of technology affords this potential, this opportunity here. Uh, and so percent of USA garbage recycled, 1960, only 6.4, today 36. And so, you know, pat ourselves on the back. We are getting better, let's say. Uh, and so we are improving our human impact on the environment in terms of recycling, reusing our stuff. Further, look at number of landfills. The number of landfills is down uh, considerably from 8,000 to 1750. Uh, and so the kind of the key idea here is the, there's fewer, uh, but those fewer ones are like on steroids. They're taking care of everyone's stuff in a, in a nearby area. Uh, and so you're seeing kind of these almost like a, a monopoly uh, in the, uh, uh, the landfill business. Very interesting stuff in which New York trucks a lot of their trash to a neighboring state. Uh, Knoxville, Knox County, they truck their garbage from Knox County to the neighboring county. In the neighboring county, they make money on that. But, of course, there becomes issues with that when you have your, your, uh, your, your uh, county now has someone else's garbage, someone else's crap, uh, let's say. Further, uh, something that is yet to be mentioned is we're very much focusing on groups. You know, all these lower, uh, lower uh, less developed uh, countries, these developing countries, control your P uh, population, by the way. Uh, whereas through those affluent countries, those high-income countries, lessen your, you know, your affluence, your technology. You know, watch out as far as, the, you know, you have way too much stuff. Where are the stuff that you need? So those are kind of these group-level things. But what about the role of individuals? What about the role of actually policymakers? There's no doubt that they, they're not listening to that I equals P times A times T formula, but there's no doubt that they have a key role. Uh, and so we can think about our good friend Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein, no doubt, the role of an individual. Uh, and so Saddam Hussein, if you know anything about him, he wasn't really concerned about the local environment. Uh, whenever he was ruling over the Iraq. Um, so there, the role of an individual, no doubt, can play a key role in the, uh, the economy. Or sorry, the environment. The economy, too. All right. So I got an example. Come on. All right. Uh, and so here we have a key term. Key term, key term, key term. Bold, italicized, underlined for a reason. I guess not italicized. Uh, sustainable development. So here's a key term. Um, I, I'll say it one more time. Here's a key term. Uh, so get this one stuck in the head. This is, this is, yes, sustainable development. The idea here with sustainable development is, you know, I've got a certain lifestyle. We all have our certain lifestyles. Uh, and we don't all of a sudden just all of a sudden go live in teepees uh, out, in the, out in the woods. Uh, to lessen our impact. We don't want to do that. We don't want to all of a sudden just change our lifestyle. And so sustainable development, the idea there is, is we continue our lifestyle, but being mindful more of future generations, being more mindful of our impact today and how it might result on future generations. And the example I always give is a coal company. And so the whole idea here is you have to kind of juggle this tenuous relationship between short-term benefits but also long-term costs. Uh, and so that's kind of the key idea here is you've got these benefits that might happen in the short term, but what are their legacies down the road? What are their impacts going forward? And so West Virginia, rich state or poor state? Rich? Um, the whole state. <laughs> the whole state other than the... Uh, 
the oh shoot, uh, what's that hotel? Uh, they're just uh, Huntington, not the Biltmore. No one cares. Um, it's poor. It's pretty poor. Uh, it's about as poor as it gets. I mean, there are some pockets there. Um, God, I'm trying to figure out what that place is. Uh, yeah, there, it is very, very poor. And so one of the things is in this, in this uh, area uh, of, the, of the country uh, is in the last two elections has really swung towards the Republican Party. Uh, they used to be actually Democrats in this area of the country. But in the last two elections, they have gone big time to the right. They've gone big time to supporting the Republican candidate. Why? Political scientists, why? Cool. What does that have to do with Republican or Democrat? Democrats want to drill? They don't. They don't, yeah, exactly. And so it's not so much that Democrats or the Democratic Party is against coal. They're just more pro other sources of energy, using other sources of energy. Where Republicans are a little bit more, hey, what's, what's, it's domestic, let's use it. Uh, it's here, we don't have to rely on someone else. And so there's both sides to that argument, we understand. But here in West Virginia, coal is number one. Uh, and so here is, you know, it's the number one economy. There's no really tourism, uh, there's really no uh, banking, uh, there's really no educate. It, it's, just, it's just coal. And so here in these places, here I am, I got a town. It's just ac absolutely economically depressed. I know someone that's big and tied with King Coal. I know someone which I, you know, I'm very well connected to coal, the coal industry. And so I, here I am, I get elected. I run on this platform in this local West Virginia town that I'm going to bring jobs. And I'm going to bring jobs via the coal industry. And so this is great. The people are all happy. Short-term benefit. 20,000 jobs here. No longer do we have economically repressed. We've got people moving to our area just because of these jobs available. So all things are great in the short term. However, 20 years down the road, I've got tons of my, my local population with black lung disease. My health care costs are through the roof because of all these people having to go to take care of these respiratory illnesses for breathing in all that coal. And so right there is an example of sustainable development. Those short-term short, short -term things are great. Uh, the economy really jumped. But the long-term negative impacts, those are what we think about sustainable development. So being mindful of those long-term impacts while making these, you know, these uh, initial decisions here. Um, so attracting a new coal plant, uh, you know, it's great. I got elected, but 20 years down the road, they'll probably be kicking that statue down as everyone uh, of me, uh, as everyone here uh, has black lung disease, lung cancer, dying at a younger age, uh, and so forth. Uh, and so here's our good friend Saddam Hussein. Uh, so Saddam Hussein, what he did was essentially he just dried up this area. This area here is known as the Fertile Crescent. They really bore you to tears. If you're bored right now, you're really bored when they talk about the Fertile Crescent in history class. I guarantee it. And so here we see the Euphrates and the Tigris River. They come together. This is one of the first areas of the world that had population settlement, population actually clustered in this area. It was because it's nothing but deserts, nothing but freaking sand here. But all of a sudden you have these rivers that come through and provide all this water for agriculture. And, but wait a minute, it's not green. Why is it not green? Because uh, Saddam Hussein was pissed off at these people who lived here. And so he got pissed off at him. I don't care if my language sucks. I don't care. Uh, it's the last day. Uh, and so this area here became brown because Saddam Hussein essentially filled up all the rivers, dammed everything up, and said, you people, now you're going to have to suffer. Uh, you don't agree with me. You're not like me. Uh, you're, not, you're, not, you're not helping me out. So I'm just going to essentially just suck off all the water, siphon it off. And now here, we can no doubt see the impact of an individual person. Uh, and so once again, the IPAT formula never factors in individuals, like that guy who you know, got elected in West Virginia, or in this case, uh, Saddam Hussein. Anyway, we'll come back to that uh, photo, trust me. Anybody military here? Military? All right, culture. Does culture play a role? I don't see a C in here. I don't see a C in the I equals P times A times C. Does culture play a role? How so? Okay. Christine. I, I, I would think, yeah, I guess, yeah. Hey. Culture. I'll use an example. Um, okay, here I am. I'm today a professional geographer. Trust me, I'm doing all the hu tree, tree hugging, all that. Uh, but here I was in, in college. I go off to college. 
Uh, and so, you know, you, you, all of a sudden you have to live on your own. You have to figure everything out. Uh, and so I go to the grocery store. I go to the grocery store, the super Walmart. I pick up uh, two bags of plastic cups, a big thing of paper plates, a big, you know, six, the whole, you know, the whole big thing of paper towels and lug it around. Why? It's the way I grew up. My family, every single meal, we didn't have a new plastic or new, a new glass, uh, uh, you know, cup. Uh, instead, every single one, you had a new red Solo cup. Every single meal. Uh, even, you know, after, you know, dinner, maybe you would go from milk to water. Still, get a brand new cup. It's just the way I grew up. Uh, it's not so much a deal where I, you know, consciously was, you know, you know, I'm, screw the environment. You know, screw it. I want the red Solo cup. I want it to be nice and clean. I had no idea. It's just the way we are raised. And so our siblings are very much influencers. Our friends are influencers. Our parents are influencers. And so our socialization, to use a term maybe you hear in sociology class, play a key role into understanding our human impact on the environment. Uh, and so if you grew up in a family where they eat granola and you know, they're all a bunch of hippies and all of that, and I don't know what, they, what, what this is, uh, but whatever, uh, you're probably going to have people that are a little bit more conscious of the environment and say it's the way you were raised. It's the way you grew up. Uh, and so there's no doubt that I've learned over time, my impact on the environment have made adjustments accordingly. Uh, and so culture, no doubt, plays a role. Uh, and this relates to assignment four. Uh, 